Well, um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Queen Butler and I'm the director of the Global Economy and Finance Program at Chatham House. Uh, and it's uh, really my great pleasure to um, moderate the next session uh, in the conference, which is on globalization and market power. And this is a, a fascinating area um, and looking at the question of uh, does globalization actually reduce market power as um, certainly I and I suspect others have long assumed, or is there a different story uh, going on? And this clearly has a great deal of current policy relevance as well as relevance over the past decades. Uh, and the paper has been authored by uh, Gian Mario Impiluti, who is professor at the Nottingham School of Economics and a research fellow at CPR and a number of other networks. And Fahad Kazmi, who is studying for a PhD in economics uh, also at Nottingham. And they will be followed uh, by um, uh, Professor Dennis Novi from uh, University of Warwick uh, with uh, discussant comments. Uh, now, as before, um, please put your questions in the Q&A box um, at any time, uh, and then we will pick them up um, in that uh, subsequent session. So I'm hoping that um, uh, we have uh, Gia Mario and Fahad who can switch their cameras on now, um, and then we can move to the presentation. Excellent, off we go. Um, I, I, can, I can start, hello everybody. Uh, seems that my video is blocked. Uh, somebody needs to allow me to start my video. Um, yeah, unable to start video, you can't start because the host has stopped it. Stopped it. Okay, uh, hopefully um, Tina can open up your video soon, if that's possible. All right. Um, okay. Well, why don't you go ahead, even if we can't see you, because we can see your slides. So I think that'd be fine. Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, uh, I'll start here. Okay. Um, so I suppose I go until eighteen past, right? So to, I yes. have nineteen, yes, 19 minutes. Nineteen minutes. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to present this paper. Um, this is joined with uh, Fahad Kazmi, um, my PhD student in Nottingham, and we're going to talk about market power and globalization. So, um, in the last decades, um, um, recent empirical evidence has um, highlighted trends in market power, increasing trends in market power in many countries. Um, when we talk about, about market power as economists, we um, talk about the ability of firms to charge a price above their marginal cost. Uh, so we're talking about markups. Um, there's a big public debate and a debate in, in academia, a lot of papers, written books uh, on, um, on the sources of market power and also on the implications of what we observe. Um, the main culprits are uh, technological change and uh, uh, regulation and antitrust. Uh, so if you, if you look at Hackout's book, uh, he points mostly at technolog technological change. The book is called The Profit Paradox. And, uh, and uh, another recent book by Philippe Pon uh, makes more an argument of, uh, of um, antitrust and regulation being at the root of the recent dynamic of market power. Uh, if we look at the data, we see that this increasing dynamics of market power, the increasing trend, uh, is quite global. It takes place in many countries in the world. And so uh, like with anything that is global, um, we think that uh, we go directly to, to, to trade and to globalization, right? So if, if this is a global phenomenon, maybe globalization uh, can be a first order uh, cause of, of this phenomenon. Uh, as trade economists, the received view, um, as Creon was uh, uh, mentioning, is that trade is pro-competitive. Trade increases competition 
and re thereby reducing market power, reduces market power and, and prices. Uh, and everybody benefits. Um, if we look at the data and that theory, the relationship between trade and market power is a bit more complex than that. It is actually indeed quite complex. So um, the goal of this paper is to um, analyze both theoretically and empirically the rich set of mechanisms of channels linking trade and market power. Um, I, I'm gonna do a quick theoretical introduction to the empirical analysis. This is gonna be ma mainly an empirical paper, but we're gonna use theory as, uh, as, as a guideline. So we're gonna, um, uh, we're gonna use a model of oligopoly trade. I am actually not even presenting the model itself. Um, I just wanna tell you um, what are the results uh, of this uh, baseline model. Mm? This is a quite standard model uh, with some new twists. Um, so it's, it's a model where firms are big. Mm? Each firm can affect the other firm market power and, and, and market share. So firms compete strategically. Um, so, uh, um, and so it's a global economy made of large firms competing strategically. Um, this, the type of competition that we analyze is could no competition, um, but that matters up to a point. So in this class of models, what you can show um, is that uh, trade liberalization has a pro-competitive effect, hmm, bilateral liberalization, has a pro-competitive effect on domestic markets, okay? So uh, if uh, the UK liberalized trade, so firms come, uh, have an, foreign firms have either access to, to UK market, therefore UK firms mm, on their own domestic sales will lose some market power mm, and this would benefit consumers. Uh, on the other hand, um, foreign firms mm, or UK firms selling abroad, okay, will see their cost of access foreign markets okay, uh, drop. And so this drop of the cost of access, uh, accessing foreign market in economies where firms have market power imply an incomplete pass-through of the cost savings to the prices, meaning that oligopolistic, oligopolistic firms, when they experience a reduction in costs, they don't pass the entire reduction in costs onto consumers, but part of this goes into markups. So, uh, if you look, if you if you look at the UK market, so then you see that dom trade liberalization reduces markups on domestic sales, but will increase will increase markups, okay, of foreign firms selling in the US in the UK market, um, and uh, and so what um, what matters uh, for the aggregate effect, even at the firm level, I would say, but you can say for the overall effect at the firm level is uh, which one of these two effects uh, um, prevails, okay? So uh, here we have an average markup, which is an, at the firm level of, of uh, an average of these two markups. And we can show that under our uh, assumptions, the pro-competitive effect prevails. And still we can say the trade is pro-competitive, reduces markups, okay? Uh, but this is just in this uh, specific model, you, know, you can have, a uh, different uh, specification that gives you different solutions. Now, if we allow, okay, free entry in the model, meaning that that result is for a given number of firms, we're comparing a world with 10 UK firms and 10 uh, foreign firms. But we know that the number of firms can change in response to trade liberalization, then uh, the, um, if we allow the opportunity of firms to, to, to enter and exit, uh, as a response to trade liberalization, we see that uh, trade unambiguously reduces the number of firms operating in each market, okay? So if before trade liberalization in the UK market, there were, there were 10 UK firms and 10 foreign firms, when you reduce trade barriers, you're gonna end up with say eight UK firms and eight foreign firms, six UK firms, and six foreign firms. 
Okay, so the market is going to be more concentrated. Uh, this reduction in the number of firms um, increases in turn market power. Okay, we less firms now, there are less firms now, they have a larger market power. So this that I call the uh, concentration effect of trade mm, reduces, weakens, or can even overturn the pro-competitive effect of trade. So if this concentration effect is, raw, is, uh, is strong, then we can uh, have um, an anti-competitive effect of trade. We can have the trade increases markets. Okay. And uh, we can show that the higher are the domestic entry costs, so the higher are the barriers to entry domestically in a market, and the higher are the economies of scale, so the higher is the level of technology in the market that we are analyzing, mm -hmm. uh, the stronger is the concentration effect. Okay, so is when a, a domestic economy is characterized, uh, is characterized uh, by um, a, um, a high barrier to entry, it is more likely the trade is going to end up increasing markups, okay? Um, so um, then we can also extend this model to a world with, where firms are different in productivity, and we can show that in this model, more productive firms end up charging higher markups, so more productive firms have higher market power. And if trade liberalization reallocates resources toward these firms, through this re reallocation channel, trade is going to increase aggregate markets. So you see there's many reasons mm, uh, to think, theory suggests that there's many reasons to think that trade can be anti-competitive, mm, can be the incomplete pass-through, the, the role of free entry and barriers to trade, so this concentration effect, and then the reallocation that acts in the aggregates. Um, so we're going to test this hypothesis, um, looking at the liberalization experienced by the Spanish economy uh, after the accession to the European Union and with the single market program implementation. Uh, so we have firm level data from Spain, um, and I'm not going to say too much about this. This is only manufacturing. Okay. Uh, this is the, the huge drop in tariffs, output tariffs, that, that the Spanish economy uh, experienced in the, in the period that we're analyzing. We're analyzing the, the period between 1990 and 2010. Um, so the way we measured markups is... Uh, um, uh, is with what we call the production factor approach is a very economic, uh, um, is a very parsimonious method because in order to estimate the markup at the firm level, you only need the input elasticity, so the elasticity output to one of the inputs that the firm uses and the input, the, the inverse of the input share. This you can read it from the data, this you can estimate it from uh, a production function estimation at the firm level, and that's what we do. So these are the estimated markups, average, average sales weighted markup uh, for the Spanish economy. This also, we also use the input weighted measure, but nothing changed. So you see that uh, in the period of large liberalization, which is the 90s essentially, you can see a remarkable drop in markups in Spain. And then there is a comeback, okay? Um, I will not speak about this comeback here. We can discuss about this later. I think it's quite interesting. It doesn't have a lot to do with trade, I think, and I have an argument for that. But let me, since I'm, I'm, I'm short of time, let me present you the, with, the, with the basic results. So this is our baseline specification. We run a, a, a battery of firm, uh, um, the fixed effect uh, regressions of markup of firm I uh, in sector J time T, okay? on the tariff, on the Spanish tariff. So we're only looking at import competition, okay? So reduction in Spanish tariff, effects of this on Spanish uh, markets. Uh, we have sectoral level control, we have time fixed effect, and then we have a bunch of uh, industry level controls. These are the main results. 
the main result is that um, the main result is that trade liberalization, so output tariff, is positively correlated with markup, which means that trade liberalization has a, um, a, a, a negative effect on markups. Okay, so trade like reduction in tariffs have an overall uh, pro-competitive effect. So all the other channels might be playing a role, but. Uh, um, uh, but uh, but we um, uh, overall you see the the um, that the, the overall effect on, at the firm level is pro competitive. We're going to investigate the presence of these other channels. Um, so the first thing we do, and I think this is a, a sort of an, an original uh, feature of the paper, we look at the role of barriers to entry. Okay, so um, I think it's quite interesting to, to interact domestic, um, the domestic structure of the economy, okay, domestic characteristics and features of markets, okay, with trade liberalization, to try to understand how these features that come from institutions, that come from technology, okay, shape the effects of trade liberalization. So we're gonna look at barriers to entry, we're gonna go to standard IO, theory that, tell, that tells us that technology is a barrier to entry. So we're gonna take intangible assets and patents. And we're also gonna go for tangible assets. That's another typical barrier to entry. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna interact the reduction in trade barriers, okay? With uh, the, the, um, um, the, the, the technological characteristics of the sector before the shock, so in 1991, so the first, sorry, it's not before, it's the first year of the shock, okay? So uh, a sector is gonna uh, be uh, labeled high barrier to entry, where if uh, the sector has uh, patents that are above median hmm, of the economy or intangible assets that are above median of the economy, we'd also check with tangible. The hypothesis that pro-competitive threats of trade, uh, the pro-competitive pro effect of trade uh, should be stronger when these barriers to entries are lower. This is exactly what we find, that the pro-competitive effect of trade is stronger when patents, when firms operate in a sector where patents are below median or where intangible assets are below median, okay? Um, so then we also test this idea of the incomplete pass-through. So the fact that uh, uh, firms do not pass tariff reduction when they translate into cost reduction on fully onto, onto consumers. How do you do that with output tariff? Well, you have to, we construct a measure of input tariff uh, using input output tables. So we construct a measure of input tariff from output tariffs, and then we regress this measure together with the measure of output tariff, okay, on the, on the firm level market. Uh, what we, we find the right signs that the input tariff, actually a reduction in input tariff uh, increases markups while the output tariff is pro-competitive. Yeah? We don't have significance here, but the signs are correct. So finally, this is the, um, uh, the final part of, of, of the paper. Um, so we have shown that at the firm level, trade is actually, as you talked, is pro-competitive. There are these offsetting channels, but uh, in this, uh, um, in this uh, uh, Spanish case we, that we analyzed, they're not, uh, um, they're not um, stronger than the, 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 the standard pro-competitive effect. Now we have to look at what happened at the link between uh, trade liberalization and aggregate markups, okay? So what we do here, we decompose the changes in markup into a between firm and within firms change. So the change in aggregate markup, which is a, a, a weighted average of all markups in the economy, produced by a change in the mark, of markups at the firm level, and, and the, the part that is produced by a change of the size of firms okay, in this average, okay, keeping the markup constant. So, what we see uh, is that um, the, uh, this is the, what we call the within changes. All within changes are negative. So that the change in the aggregate markup, okay, driven by 
the change of the firm level markup, the change of markup of each firms is negative, okay? So this within China markups decline always because firms in this period are reducing markups at the firm level. While the, what we call reallocation, okay, which is this uh, uh, red bar, um, they also have, they also contribute to a reduction in markups, but also to increase in markups. So it's a bit more mixed. Giamari, I'm, I'm sorry if you could uh, uh, wrap up in the next minute or so. Um, yeah, I am, I am also, up. this is the last, the, the last match. Brilliant, I, thank I, you so much. I sorry about this. Minutes, uh, yeah. um, okay, so then what we do, um, we, reg uh, we regress each one of these components uh, 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 on, on the change in output tariffs. And what we find, uh, we find exactly what we were expecting that the within component, okay, the, the, the effect of markups at, uh, of trade on markups at the firm level is pro competitive, while reallocation is anti competitive. So trade is doing exactly what you thought. Uh, which is that it's reallocating resources toward um, more productive, larger firms, and they are charging higher markets. So this reallocation, via this reallocation, trade liberalization is going to increase aggregate markets. And this is what uh, Varin and an author called the super solid fats. They haven't tested it, but they have uh, made this assumption. We have tested this assumption, and it's actually so. The presumption is that more productive firms or larger firms charge higher markups. And this is what we find here when we look at the relationship between firm sales and markups, we do it with assets, we find the same. All right, so I can conclude. Um, we analyzed a comp the complex relationship between trade and market power. We use a simple model to guide our econometric specification. Uh, the model gives us a rich set of predictions. Then we tested them with Spanish firm level data. We found that the large liberalization uh, um, episode experienced by Spain in the post EU entry is by and large pro competitive. Um, but we find uh, evidence of several feedback effects through the other channels that are anti competitive. Um, and I stop here. Jim Mario, thank you very much. And I'm really sorry for, for rushing you. Um, so now, uh, Dennis, would you like to um, give your comments? I'm not sure if you're sharing a slide or, or not. Yes. Hi, yep. everybody. I actually do have some slides. Let me share them. And can you see them, the slides, and you can hear me? Yeah. Yes, to both. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, well, thanks to the organizers for uh, putting uh, me on the program and, and, and letting me discuss this paper by Jamario and Fahad. Now, let me say up front that I have taken liberty here as a discussant to, broad, to, to uh, paint a much broader brush picture of the general context. I'm not going to give very, very detailed comments on the paper itself or on the mathematics and empirical results. And I think hopefully the broader picture is a little bit more useful in this context. All right, so let me see how I, one of the major questions here in this paper, does more globalization mean more market power? So what we've seen in many countries around the world over recent decades is number one, a rise in trade globalization or trade liberalization. And number two, a rise in market power, market concentration in many industries, and many firms. And the question is, are one and two related? And is there perhaps a causal link? So did more globalization, perhaps through better trading technologies, lower trade costs, cause a rise in market power? I think this is of the key issue at the policy angle. Now, I don't think I need to convince the audience that there's been a rise in international trade and FDI and globalization in that way. Um, let me focus a bit more on the rise of market power. As Jamari was pointing out, this is the ability of firms to squeeze profits out of consumers or customers by charging a price above the cost. And that's what we call the markup. And here's a distribution of markups. This is from the Deluca Goldberg Carnival Partnership. 2016 econometrica paper. This is data for India, but as John Mario pointed out, the evidence is there for lots of countries. And you can see here the distribution of markups in the dashed line in 1989, and then the solid line for a few years later in 1997. Now, if you're not used to those sort of distributions, 
uh, you might think, oh, well, those two lines kind of look the same, the shape is the same. Well, actually, the black solid line is shifted to the right by quite a bit. So this is a substantial, may not look like this, but this is a substantial increase in profits or implied profits market power of firms. So clearly this is happening. This is for India, but it's been confirmed for many other countries. Now, why are these being these markups being charged and higher? Well, it turns out it's large firms that charge higher markups. So what you see here is from the same paper on the left hand side, the log quantity, this is essentially the size of sales. So this will be larger firms selling more, you'll find them to the right. And then the markups on the vertical axis. And you can see that that's a positive relationship. Well, strictly speaking, it's a cloud here, right? There's a, it's a very complex relationship. There are lots of things going on, but there's a clear positive correlation. And on the right-hand panel, you can see, well, lower, um, higher quantity, so larger firms are associated with lower costs, right? So the large firms tend to uh, have lower prices, but higher markups, all, all else being equal, and clearly there's something about firms going on here. On concentration and superstar firms in particular, this is from Otto Don Katz, Patterson, Van Rien, and last year in the QJE. Um, this is the concentration or indices of concentration across various industries. This is for the US, but many, many other countries show similar patterns. And this is the market concentration and percent of the top four largest firms in industry. Top inside, you have wholesale trade top right you have services then utilities transportation and at the bottom right you have finance you can see that everywhere these measures of concentration have risen right? the different colors are different ways of measuring this don't pay too much attention to this the point is that everywhere there's been a clear rise this data starts here in 18, 1980 or 1990 until uh, the 2010s so all those things are clearly happening in the data and i think none of that is controversial amongst economists they all agree that we have experienced this now as i said the big firms the more productive firms tend to charge higher markups including these superstar firms why are they able to do that uh, well Potential mechanisms include technical change, especially call them winner takes all technologies with strong returns to scale. As Jamario pointed out, also lots of intangible assets. Think Facebook and Amazon. These are essentially network business models. And the larger your network, the more efficient in some sense you get. So that's a classic returns to scale type of business model. And there you can get uh, larger firms becoming increasingly dominant. But there's also a role for policy, Jamario pointed that out, mergers and acquisitions, collusion, perhaps antitrust or regulation, not as, as fierce as perhaps they, they should be. Now, given that background though, um, the conventional view held by economists is that trade is pro-competitive. Uh, for example, Feinstein Weinstein show this for the US and other studies have shown this for others that markups have fallen over time uh, due to trade liberalization. And also we've seen a rise in product variety. Now I just wanna point out here, this conventional view by economists is not one of opinion or preference. This is what the data are telling us on average. So that's, that's why economists a holding of view. However, I would argue, and this is kind of an interpretation of Jamarius and Pirates paper, this is not set in stone. We don't quite know that yet. And I think there's a lot of a lot of more uh, twists and angles to, to be explored. Now, um, what they do in this paper is precisely get at this. So on the theoretical side, there's trade and oligopoly. That means there's just a few firms in the market and those firms tend to behave strategically, which is probably a realistic description of how in most markets firms operate because it's not thousands of firms in each market. It tends to be a small number of firms that really dominate. We've seen this, uh, the, the previous picture I showed you by Otter et al. Uh, that's quite unusual literature. Most of the literature focuses on either perfect competition or monopolistic competition where markups are either zero or constant, little attention has been paid to variable markups that you can get in oligopoly for basically a technical reason. It's harder to model, especially in gen equilibrium, but arguably more relevant. And on the empirical side, they look at evidence from Spain, uh, the 1986 accession of Spain to the European community, and then the adoption of the single market uh, for the following years. And it's both firm level and aggregate evidence. And here's an estimate of the 
markups by industry. This is straight from, from their paper. And you can see that uh, the markups can be quite substantial. So if, if, if the number were one here in this column, that would mean no markup. So for example, textiles and apparels, that's industry number four in this table, the markup would be 90%. So that's, that's, that's fairly high, but there's a lot of variation across industries. One thing that you could do, and maybe you have in your paper, but just not on the slides, is compare this to what other people have shown literature. This is going back to the Indian data here by Deluca et al., which is a very similar table. And if you look at textiles and apparel, uh, the markup's actually lower here for India, 1.59 at 57. This might not be surprising because while the Indian textile industry may be very different from the Spanish textile industry, but it would be quite interesting to uh, show more comparisons and put this in the bigger picture. And here you can see actually some very, very large numbers. For example, electrical machinery, communications, industry 31, you have 5.66, which is really, really high. Uh, now, Dennis, on the uh, empirical finding, trade yeah. is pro-competitive, meaning at least on average, markups tend to decline in response to liberalization, which is in line with what many other papers have found before. There's distinctions between inputs and outputs. Uh, that also matters in terms of supply chains, but entry barriers weaken this pro-competitive effect. There's just not enough entry. Firms are not entering enough. And reallocation tends to push market share towards the larger firms, including superstar firms. So let me end by throwing out some really broad brush comments on what I think is relevant here for politics and policy. What about the distributional effects? That's something that the paper doesn't speak to, but I think it matters very much for policy. Is it that poor households benefit from this or they don't benefit from this relative to rich households? So really across the income distribution, important issue. It's not entirely obvious what happens there. I think this is a budding literature, Borosek and Jaravel's one recent paper. Then what about cross sectors? Is manufacturing impacted in a different way than services? That is also correlated with regions, of course. Is Lincolnshire different from London in terms of industry composition? Of course it is, so that might have regional aspects too. It also ties into this wider aspect of rising inequality. And if I can just guess, uh, why do we have more inequality? My reading of the literature would say about 75% or so of this increase in inequality that we've seen almost everywhere on the planet is probably driven by technology and education, technical change, which favors more educated, more skilled uh, people in the workforce. And only a, a minority, perhaps 25% or so, uh, that's sort of a rough guess here, obviously, it might be driven by globalization, more trade and FDI. And from that, this is, I'm going to stop here. Yes. Uh, mm. We have implications for policy, right? So we probably need not necessarily a bigger state, but a more nimble state that can react to that. And we probably also need to have another look at regulation and competition policy because firm entry is not enough. We need more dynamism and also more firm investment. All yeah, right, so let you. me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and Jamaro, thanks for um, the great paper. And uh, Dennis, thank you for some really excellent comments. Um, what I want to do is give Jim Mario and maybe uh, Fahad, if he's, he's with us, I, I assume he is, uh, a chance to come back on... Um, uh, Dennis's uh, analysis and uh, questions. But before that, I'd like to take, because we're very short of time, unfortunately, um, uh, some of the questions that have been posed. So we've actually got two uh, sets of questions. So if I, if I read those out, uh, actually, they're more coming in. So let me just take the first two. Um, firstly, uh, from Michael, Michael Gazoriak, he says, uh, can you say a bit more about A, the role of changes in technology impacting on markups? Well, that's to some extent, what um, Dennis has also uh, discussed, and whether your data allow you to explore the differential role of technology depending on firm size, um, i.e. Heterogen heterogeneity, and can you say anything about the variation across sectors? And then uh, Camilla Jensen has also uh, asked uh, to Giamario, um, how do you measure the markup in the paper and how robust is it in view, uh, how robust is it in view uh, to the of the multinational practices such as transfer pricing and GBC logics. Logistics, I think, is probably what um, is meant there. So, um, Giamario, perhaps I could come back to you now and uh, 
both responding to those questions and also any of the points that you want to pick up um, from those that Dennis has made. That would be great. And you want, yeah, you've got your screen on. That's great. Thank you very much, um, Kieran, and thank, thank you, Dennis, for, for the discussion. Um, in terms of the discussion, I mean, Dennis has provided a, a very big picture. So that is, as he said, nothing specific on the paper. So, um, yeah, I, I, I agree um, that uh, looking at the impact and, on inequality is extremely important. Actually, I have worked on that as well. Um, and uh, and there are several things that you can you, you can um, uh, market power is important not only for the distribution, by the way, of, of personal income distribution, but also for what economists used to call uh, a functional income distribution. So it's like this is the entire book by 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 Piketty, right? So. Um, you know, labor, the, the, in this way of measuring markups, if you, you use a labor share to, uh, to estimate the market, you're going to get an inverse relationship between the market and the labor share. So when the markup goes up, the labor share goes down. And so this implies, from a societal point of view, that, uh, that, um, that uh, 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 firms uh, are getting more, uh, co corporate profits are getting, are getting more and more of, of the uh, higher share of the pie, and workers uh, a smaller one, which is potentially problematic. Um, in terms of the question, I don't. So we can say something about technology. Uh, we that that bit that I showed you in the last years of uh, where you see an increase in market, that is because the elasticity uh, um, changes, the elasticity component of the market changes, and that is a technological component. So that increase in markups is mostly due to some sort of technological change, which we could investigate as well. We have, um, these data are pretty good um, in terms of uh, uh, technological uh, um, components, uh, technological information. Um, how do I measure? We, we measure the markups, as, as I said, we use this production function approach, uh, which essentially is very parsimonious because you just need the input share and the elasticity of output with respect to, 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 the, to, the, to the particular input you choose. Um, and and, uh, and, and you, you can obtain that via production function estimation. Uh, we can't say much in the data uh, about multinational practices. So we don't, we don't have them in the data set. Um, so the last question about the network effect, um, does the existence of network fed and scope for price discrimination within the international market create a case for negotiation international competition rules in digital industry? That's a very detailed question, and we can we 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 way more macro. But um, this incomplete pass through is exactly pricing to market. So essentially, uh, uh, the model is showing that there is pricing to market. Okay? So when I say that. Uh, when trade costs drop, I don't uh, um, firms with market power don't pass into into consumers the entire reduction in in, in the in costs produced by the drop in tariffs. That is actually this price discrimination. Um, so okay, so Mario, I think uh, that's that's very good. I wanted to, Fahad, I wondered if there's any anything you wanted to add um, in terms of comments or, or general observations. Um, I, I think uh, Jim Mario perfectly echoed my sentiments. Um, as far as the questions are concerned, uh, he's right in pointing out that uh, the increase that we saw was uh, primarily driven by the elasticity, so we can attribute that to uh, technological change. And um, and yeah, um, we're still obviously in the process of. I just to add a bit more about the data uh, pro uh, generating process. We've actually. Um, control for price, we have data on price changes. So we've managed to create firm specific uh, price deflators to deflate our variables to account for, account for any sort of variation in that regard. So in terms of the potential biases that a lot of the literature regarding production function approaches have pointed out, we've tried to mitigate those, those concerns as well. Uh, so in terms of the econo econometrics behind what we've uh, sort of uh, looked at, uh, we've tried to make sure that it's fairly robust as well. 
Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I'm afraid we're out of time. So I, I have to thank um, Gio Mario and Fahad for a really interesting paper. It's provoked a lot of questions. Um, and Dennis for some, some really good um, comments and also the sort of broader policy questions at the end. Um, if you want to continue the discussion with um, the authors uh, and with Dennis, then you can move to the um, wonder uh, area, which uh, I think you already have the link for. And I think in terms of the sessions, we will need to come back uh, in five minutes. So that's at 22 uh, for the next session. But um, thank you very much to, to all those who uh, took part and also for those who put the questions. And we'll see you in five minutes. Thank you.